Welcome and aloha. I am Mark Schlaub, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to Canada, our northern neighbor. My guest today is Bill Scott. Canada is Bill Scott's home and native land. <laughs> Bill is a Canadian lawyer who lives and works in Toronto, Canada. Bill worked at a major law firm in Toronto for 36 years before becoming senior legal consultant at CI Investments, the largest independent wealth manager in Canada, where he has worked for the last 18 months. We've not heard much from our Canadian friends here in Canada, and so I've asked Bill to tell us about the current personal, professional, and political climate in Canada. Hello, Bill. Uh, how are you? Thanks, Mark. I'm very well, thanks. Did I did I uh, get your your title correct uh, at CI? Yeah, Investments? no, no, absolutely. Yeah. All right, and, uh, and, CI I, and sorry, my my 36 years at uh, at my former law firm, I I was fortunate. I, I think I worked in more offices than any other lawyer in the firm I was in. Uh, I was the first articling student in our Ottawa office. I was in London for eight years. I spent uh, the better part of a year in Budapest when we had an office there. And then I was out in Singapore, which is what sort of established my, uh, some of my Asian connections. And then I returned to Toronto and, and now I've, I've been here for the last 22 years. Well, you, you've uh, traveled uh, around uh, quite a bit, but Canada is your native land, right? Absolutely, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's get right into it. Um, I mean, what is the current COVID-19 status in Toronto and Canada as a whole, and how has it affected Canadians, lawyers, and the practice of law? Okay, well, we can unpack that in various parts. Please. Um, you know, in mid-March, uh, we had our politicians declaring an emergency, and they imposed a, a very strict lockdown. Um, basically told everybody that unless they had, you know, absolutely compelling reasons, they were to stay at home. Um, you know, the exceptions were to go to the, the grocery store if you needed to, um, liquor store, I mean, hardware stores. I mean, there were various uh, segments of the retail, uh, retail businesses that were, you know, seen as being essential services. So you were allowed to go, go out to those. Um, social distancing and masking was, uh, was imposed. Uh, and, you know, for the most part, people, you know, follow the rules pretty closely. Um, the culture here is a little bit different than perhaps it is in your country in the sense that, you know, as opposed to um, <clears throat> pursuit of liberty and happiness, uh, you know, our ruling, our constitutional rules refer to peace, order and good government. So, <laughs> uh, so good government involved our politicians um, getting up. And as, as I was saying earlier, getting up and, um, you know, really, really taking the bull by the horns. Uh, we had daily, uh, certainly in Ontario, we had daily conferences every morning uh, at about 11 o'clock with the prime minister that was broadcast across um, CBC radio, which is our national, national broadcaster. And then later in the afternoon, our premier, uh, Doug Ford would get up and give a similar presentation, um, you know, and they would, it's somewhat like the um, press conferences, I guess, in the States, but they would have, you know, scientists, cabinet ministers getting up uh, and laying down the laws to, um, you know, what, what people had to do. I mean, they were very much treating it as a public emergency as opposed to uh, anything of a political nature and saying, look, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, we have to deal with this immediately. Um, the only way that we can uh, possibly open up the economy going forward um, is to flatten the curve in terms of, um, you know, increased cases of COVID um, and deaths. Um, and I think the population generally accepted that. So, I mean, from a professional point of view, um, certainly in my firm, we had two, two 3,000 employees. I mean, apart from the, the fellows that had to come in to... Um, you know, make sure the computer's working, everybody was sent home and everybody's been working from home pretty well ever since. I, I certainly have. Um, I went into the office on Friday and that's the first time I've been there in six months. 
Um, and, you know, it, it worked out well in the sense that, um, you know, it was pretty well a seamless transition. There was, there was some, so we're in the wealth management business, so there, was, there were some bumps in the road in terms of getting our traders set up to trade properly, and they, they needed specialized systems. But for everybody else, um, you know, working from home using, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Teams meetings, um, corresponding by email, corresponding, you know, dealing with each other by phone, uh, what have you. I mean, uh, it really, it really went very smoothly, surprisingly smoothly. Um, and I think the same is true of, of the large law firms, the larger law firms, you know, the, the bulk of the work that they would do would typically be, you know, online, um, through the internet, um, through the phone. Um, obviously they're using, um, video conferences, perhaps much more so than they did in the past. Slightly different in the case of smaller firms. I, mean, I was in the process of moving house, so I was buying and selling some properties. And so I was dealing with you know, my lawyer, who was a one-man shop. And, and that was quite different in the sense that, you know, we went in, we had to be wearing masks. Uh, he was behind a desk with a plastic screen. Uh, we had to put on plastic gloves, you know, to sign documents. Um, so I think it's kind of a horses for courses in, in terms of how it actually affected um, individual lawyers. Uh, but I, I was talking to one of my former partners on the phone this morning, and he said that, um, you know, even now, there's only a handful of lawyers that have been going into the office, uh, in part because, <laughs> because they feel that paying the vast amounts that they're paying for, uh, you know, expensive, pricey real estate uh, on the top of an office tower, they ought to be using it but uh, they're definitely in the minority. Um, in terms of the general situation in Canada, you know, we're, we're, we are experiencing a spike at the moment and the, um, the government is reacting to that. Um, Ontario had 700 new cases today, which is a record. Uh, wow. And this is, you know, reported cases coming about as a result testing. And in Quebec, the number is even higher and uh, in Quebec, they, they've imposed a lockdown, a, a new 28-day lockdown uh, um, in the three, three areas that they've identified as being hotspots. Um, and they're basically shutting, you know, shutting restaurants down or shutting, uh, you know, any, certain types of retail businesses down um, and requiring people to stay at home. Um, we've had, you know, a, a phased approach here in Ontario. Uh, the first first phase was everybody had to stay at home. Second phase was certain things started to open up, certain types of businesses. Uh, third phase was to allow you know people to generally go about uh, their business in the usual way, subject to wearing masks, um, practicing social distance, um, you know, using a lot of disinfectant. Um, but you know we're we're moving back from that at the moment. Um, in terms of numbers. Now, Canada has a population of about one tenth of the United States, and we've had, uh, you know, about 150,000 reported cases across the country over the last six months, and we've had less than less than 10,000 deaths. Um, so our numbers are, you know, substantially different than what you've experienced in the states, unfortunately. Um, you might want to ask what our law societies have done. There really hasn't been an awful lot for them to do in terms of helping helping lawyers. That The one thing that they did do was defer fees, um, both the law society and the, um, you know, our insurance corporation. Um, so they for, they gave everybody a six month, um, six month furlough, as it were, uh, without having to pay fees, although now we're paying double fees because that's kicked back in. Whether they'll, you know, revisit that and extend it further, um, given that the current situation is continuing, um, you know, remains to be seen. Um, well, it, it it sounds like it sounds like uh, you uh, Canadians are uh, satisfied with their leadership. Uh, I, I don't hear, you know, I I I I don't hear you thinking that it hasn't been. Uh, doing a good job. Sounds like it's been doing a good job during this period of time. Is that a correct? Uh, yeah, I think that I think the general sense, the general sense in the population is that the governments, the governments have been doing a good job. I mean, it's split, you know, it's split between 
given our political system, you know, you have the federal government uh, dealing with, you know, what's within their bailiwick. And then you have the provincial governments and some of them have been taking different approaches. I mean, for example, uh, the Maritimes, you know, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland have effectively sealed themselves off. So that unless you have an absolutely compelling reason to go there, you're not allowed to go there. I mean, PEI, which is an island, you know, had, had you know, the provincial police sitting out on the bridge, which is the only way you can get there, um, checking everybody out and turning lots of people away. Um, you know, even, even within that bubble, there were pretty substantial restrictions. Well, you know, you know, we're, we, we are allowing people to come to Hawaii, but there is a 14 day quarantine uh, for out of state uh, visitors. And we, we're gonna try to open it up some more so that if you have a test, you can avoid the quarantine. But is there, yeah. if I come in, can I come into Canada? I mean, is there- No. Can I come to Toronto? No, okay. No, short answer is no. Okay. I mean, unless, unless you're a Canadian citizen, um, you're not allowed, I mean, the borders are closed. Um, or they're, they're effectively closed coming this way. Um, if you do, you know, if you're a Canadian citizen, let's say you're coming back from the UK, uh, you have to go into a 14 day quarantine and it's enforced uh, in the sense, you know, we had some friends, we had some friends who had property in Florida that they had to go down to because they were doing a pile of renovations. And this was several months ago, early on. And so they said, okay, fine, we'll go down there. And I guess they kept to themselves. Um, and when they came back, you know, they had to register with the police and, you know, they followed up. They were getting phone calls every day to find out where they were and what they were doing. And, and uh, you know, with an iPhone, they can actually track where you physically are. Um, so the, um, you know, the enforcement of the quarantine is, it's a real thing. And, you know, there have been people who, you know, haven't followed the quarantine rules and, uh, you know, are facing pretty stiff fines as a result. You know, let, let me, I want to kind of pursue that a little bit more because, uh, you know, in, in the 60s, I recall, many U.S. Uh, uh, citizens went to Canada to avoid the draft and military service during Vietnam War. And now uh, I know that many U.S. Uh, citizens are thinking about going to Canada uh, because of the political and social climate in the United States, not necessarily the COVID problem. Uh, so you're saying basically because of COVID, uh, we can't come in, Amer Amer US uh, citizens can't come in. I mean, are, are you? I'm sure you're aware of the desire of US uh, uh, citizens to get into Canada at some point. Is there any thought about it from the Canadian point of view or is it, uh, Something well, I don't. I don't think. I don't think anybody sees it as being, you know, a threat to our <laughs> threat to our borders that we're going to have, you know, large numbers of Americans crossing illegally. Um, I mean, you know, we have we have fairly detailed rules as to what's involved in immigrating to Canada, and we have a point system, and it applies to you know immigrants from anywhere else in the world. So, if somebody from New York wants to move to Canada, you know, they're in the same pool as people from India or, you know, Asia or anywhere else. Um, and, you know, there's a system that winnows out who's going to get in and who doesn't. Um, you know, there hasn't been any, any, uh, so far as I'm aware, sort of any, any move to try and restrict immigration generally. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's, you know, Americans don't get a free pass as it were if they want to move to Canada, they're in the same position as anybody else anywhere else in the world. Um, now, now in the, from the other point of view, uh, we in Hawaii have welcomed Canadians over the years. I mean, they've been a big impetus to the economy and they're, they call themselves snowbirds yeah. because they come in the winter and they uh, buy vacation homes and condos. Uh, when is is that going to open up? Are they allowed to travel out now, or could it, uh, is there a future for well, that? Well, the problem the problem is not traveling out of Canada. I mean, I could get on a plane to Hawaii tonight if I oh, wanted. To. Oh, okay. All right. All right. There are no restrictions there. the The difficulty is getting into the states. So, again, talking about my friends who, I mean, firstly, if I was to drive to Buffalo and try and cross the border, um, 
whatever my reasons were, I would get turned away um, by the US immigration people. Um, if, if I flew into the States and I'd, I'd be able to do that, I wouldn't be restricted from a Canadian perspective. But again, you know, once I got there, well, and actually flying into the States from Toronto, you, you go through immigration at the airport here. It's purely a function of, you know, what the immigration officer is prepared to let you do. So again, I mentioned my friends who had to go down to Florida and, you know, they, they said, look, you know, we've got all this work going on at our house. We have to, we have to be there. And they were let through. Um, but, you know, I've heard, I heard a case just on the weekend of, you know, a very wealthy couple who had a big place in Arizona and they tried the same thing. Uh, they told the customs official or the immigration officials, oh, we've got all this work going on in our house. We have to be there. They went there and then somebody showed up, you know, from Homeland Security or whatever and saw that, you know, there was no work going on and that this place was fully built. And, and they got they got blacklisted as a result. They got A thrown in and B got blacklisted, which means that, you know, God knows when they're going to be able to go back to this five or ten million dollar property that they have in the States. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's really, it's really a question of, you know, what the, the U.S. officials are prepared to say. And so it, um, it's kind of, it sounds like snowbirds are not going to be able to get over here when it starts. Well, no, I've, I've got, I've got several friends who have, you know, very nice ski properties just on the other side of the border in, you know, just south of Buffalo, mm -hmm. um, you know, along Lake Erie. And yeah, they cannot go there. Oh, boy. And they're not expecting to be able to go there till whenever. Um, it's, uh, you know, and it's a problem for them. Now, uh, you know, and, and that really follows up on the next question I have for you, and that's the economy. I mean, the economy of Hawaii has taken a huge hit because of our lack of tourists. What's yeah, happening? Well, uh, and has anybody come up with some ideas about how to help the economy in Canada? Well, yeah, the, the economy in Canada, I mean, firstly, we had, you know, this sort of massive shutdown. And, you know, depending upon the nature of your business, um, you know, life either stopped dead in its tracks or it went on. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm in a business that, um, you know, as our CEO says, gets paid every day. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, life has gone on quite happily. If I was working at Air Canada, you know, I'd probably be out of a job now. Um, you know, there, there were certain types of businesses, particularly hospitality, you know, personal service, dentists, doctors. I mean, I, I know any number who, you know, haven't worked for the last, they've only just started working again. Um, so, you know, it's, it depends upon the specific field that you're in. Um, as part of the federal government's um, measures, you know, they, they provided an income supplement to basically everybody who said that they, they needed it, um, you know, which is a pretty modest amount, but it was, um, you know, it helped. Um, and they've been transitioning a lot of people to uh, unemployment insurance to the extent that they're eligible. But, you know, there, there are people now who are getting cut off because the six month time frame has elapsed. Um, so, you know, it's, it's people that, you know, work in the gig economy, uh, or, you know, bars, restaurants, hotels, that sort of thing, who, who've been very hard hit. I mean, I, I've got a daughter that works in the hospitality business and you know, she was out of work, um, you know, for four or five months. Have, have, uh, and I don't, you know, I, the, you know, the, the. I was going to say that the one thing that's that's interesting about all of this is that the world has suddenly got much smaller for a lot of people, but it's it's had the effect of you know certainly in Ontario and and elsewhere across Canada there's there's much more of a focus on local tourism, right? So instead of you know flying off to Europe for the summer or down to the states, you know people are discovering Ontario. And there's lots you know there's lots to see, there's lots to do, but it's not. So you have locals in effect replacing, you know, the foreign the foreign tourists that we that would ordinarily come in here during the summer. Mm -hmm. um, we we so we've the, seen some of that too. You know. Yeah. So the economy is not Canadian economy. I don't think is really taken that much 
that much of a hit. I mean, apart from specific areas like uh, tourism and hospitality, um, you know, the financial industry, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the Canadian economy is based on you know resources. Um, that has been affected somewhat, but not dramatically. Um, so, you know, I, we're not really feeling the pinch yet. Uh, we may, that may change you know, over the next six months or a year remains to be seen. You know, um, you, you're, you're at home now and you've been at home for, for months. Uh, are you feeling the stress? I mean, a lot of people are feeling no. stress. Being a, no, no. Uh, no, I, well, I mean, I don't have little kids running around. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we live in a fairly substantial property and um, out in the country. So it's, you know, it's been very pleasant, actually. Frankly, not having to commute down to the office every day, which, you know, would be an hour or so's trip, um, has been quite pleasant. It's added a couple of hours to my day. Um, so, I mean, people ask me, I was saying earlier on, you know, what are the what are the things that have changed dramatically? I think the things that have changed dramatically is a I've been spending more time with my wife and my the rest of my family than I have for the last 36 years. Number one. Uh, number two, I've been getting more sleep um, than I've had in the last 36 years. Um, you know, often does it go to bed at nine o'clock at night. And um, yeah. You know, number three, eating three square meals a day at home, you know, makes a big difference. Um, certainly not eating uh, any junk food, at, you know, fast food restaurants downtown. So, you know, there, there are pluses and minuses all around. But I, you know, I certainly know people who, you know, they live, live in small apartments. They have kids um, downtown. And, you know, for people like that, it's, it's been tough. Um, particularly since, you know, the kids were let out of school in mid-March and, and have only just now gone back, and a lot of a lot of families aren't comfortable sending their kids back to school in person. So you know they've either been putting them in online courses, and you know the Toronto School Board was expecting I don't know, roughly fifty percent of the kids to come back in person, and then at the very last minute that number went down dramatically, and so they've been scrambling for the last couple of weeks to get online courses up and running for all these extra kids. And then a lot of people have just said, you know, to hell with this, this is all too dangerous. And, you know, I've clubbed together with others. Um, so you'll have, you know, four, five, 10 kids, whatever. And um, they just, they've hired their own teacher. So they have teaching pods at home. Um, so, so, you know, a, a not insignificant section of the, the public school system has suddenly become privatized overnight. Um, and all the whole question about education has become a huge challenge and, and people still haven't figured it out. They're in the process of doing that. Let me, let me ask you a question in the few minutes we have left about the relationship between Canada and the United States. And what, you know, we have, you we really want to talk about that? <laughs> well, we want to hear about it. I mean, yeah. You know, okay. Uh, and, and, the, and we're, we're, we're all friends. We're, you know, we feel friendly towards Canada and yeah. I, I have Canadian friends and you're my friend and but but I, I we haven't heard much and I'm just is there a, a feeling about is there a well, the, the first the feeling? first thing the first thing Mark that you need to appreciate is that you know Canadians follow the political situation in the states very very closely hmm. uh, I mean my wife and I I Hate to admit, I mean, we watch CNN, you know, for a couple of hours every evening because it's the best entertainment on TV. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people are troubled, you know, it, because somebody like Mr. Trump is so completely different than, you know, any politician in Canada who would ever get elected. Um, you know, I think they're, they're, they are tr troubled by the situation in the States. Um, by the polarization in the states, the effect it's having on uh, just your political culture generally um, is worrisome. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I expect vast numbers of people here will be watching the debate tomorrow night, which I think will be critical. We'll see how that plays out. But on the other hand, you know, I, I mean, the political culture here is not amenable to somebody like Mr. Trump except, you know, a relatively small 
um, segment of the population. Um, you know, there are, there, I have friends who are, you know, firm Trump supporters. Um, in in and Canada, have, Canadian friends oh, or American friends? No, no, Canadian oh, friends. Oh, oh, okay. And, you know, I, I think it, it kind of boils down to your philosophical view of the world, you know, is, is, uh, is it a case where it's appropriate for you to, you know, conduct all of your actions with a view to what's best for me, and I don't really care about anybody else. Um, you know, which, while you may disagree with that, is not a completely crazy, crazy point of view. They tend to be the Trump supporters uh, versus those who feel that, you know, regardless of, uh, you know, your personal circumstances, you owe a certain responsibility to your fellow citizens. And, you know, there's a cost that's associated with that. Um, and that's, you know, that's that's more, I think, the Canadian way. Um, you know, we have socialized medicine for everybody, um, you know, and we have, we have a much more socialized system and have done over the last, you know, it's developed over the last 50, 75 years. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the, the political fabric. And uh, our politicians don't, don't seek to rip that up, turn that upside down. I mean, they just, they would not be tolerated here. Um, so they, there are very, you know, the, the two countries are very different in that respect. Um, and uh, and, th and that, that may be why uh, a lot of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, citizens are thinking about going to Canada. Uh, well, I, I have several close U.S. friends who would love to move here tomorrow. So. <laughs> Look, we, we, we have a, about one minute left. Uh, what, what, are, what are your feelings? What are your feelings about the future and all of this crazy time? And well, where, I think, where, I think where, what are your thoughts? I think the jury is still out as to how this is all going to play out. Um, I think until we have a you know effective, proven set of vaccines, that things are not going to go back to normal. Um, we, I don't think anybody here, you know, I think people here have a, a more realistic view as to when that's likely to happen. Um, so I, I think we could be looking at you know another year of this uh, or something similar, um, and you know we just have to deal with it. Well, uh, I appreciate your thoughts. I appreciate uh, hearing from our neighbors in Canada. Uh, Bill Scott, it's been a pleasure having you as my guest today. And, uh, you know, it's good to hear from you. Good to hear about Canada, what's happening there. And uh, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to travel to each other's country in the future so aloha. Well, or, or failing failing that we can meet up in shanghai next spring which i, I yeah. haven't booked my ticket i haven't booked my tickets yet That's we shall see. yeah i haven't either I and mean, who knows what's going to happen all right uh bill thank you very much aloha everybody and talk to hey, you later. best wish best wishes from the north thank you all of you